kill zone, Iwo Jima. 70,000 US Marines, 21,000 entrenched Japanese, eight square miles of death. True stories of true grit. The anatomy of close quarters combat and daring nighttime raids. An apocalyptic slugfest against a suicidal enemy with its back against the wall. They say the vets of Iwo Jima have no fear of going to hell because they've already been there. This is Shootout Iwo Jima, fight to the death. February 19, 1945, Iwo Jima, 8.30 a.m. The heaviest pre-invasion bombardment so far in World War II is coming to an end. The battle for Iwo Jima is about to be turned over to the grunts. It was sheer determination and guts. The only perfect battle on a perfect battlefield in the history of the Marine Corps, our country, and possibly the world. Nothing like an innocent woman or a child or any type of civilian. Strictly fighting man against the fighting man. You'll never have another one like that. Never. Fate has put these U.S. Marines and this tiny eight square mile volcanic speck of an island square into the crosshairs of history. Having seized the Marianas Islands in the summer of 1944, the relentless American juggernaut is now within 1,200 miles of Tokyo, striking distance for the long range B-29 bomber. Located exactly halfway between the Marianas and Tokyo, Iwo, with its two completed airfields and a third under construction, would make the perfect emergency landing base for American bombers. And also Iwo Jima could be a forward operating base for, and this is an important point, fighters. Fighters that can fly an escort to the strategic bombing aircraft that were bringing a terrible bombing campaign to the Japanese home islands on a daily basis. Iwo must be taken. The invasion plan calls for two marine divisions to land on the southeast coast, just to the right of Mount Suribachi, the 550-foot volcano that holds the island's highest ground. The 28th Regiment of the 5th Marines will wheel left to sever Suribachi from the rest of the island. The other Marines will push north to close with the enemy and capture the airfields. Rather than meet the invasion force head on, the Japanese plan is to wait for the beachhead to become clogged with men and machines before they begin their onslaught. The Marines that survive the beach will then be drawn into a war of attrition through a series of fortified sectors arrayed across the length of the island. 9.02 a.m. The first Marine boots sink into the black sands of Iwo Jima. It was ankle deep, you know, and you couldn't run. You had to just plunge along, you crawl up or something like that. And that was the most porous sand I've ever mired up in. And you'd go up a step uh, and you'd fall back too. At first, resistance is light, with only scattered bursts of small arms. Then, Mount Suribachi comes alive with fire. By the time we landed, it was several hours after HR, uh, that's when the stuff hit the fan. Because you saw the sand kicking up, and explosions here and there, and there's a lot of fire all over the place. It was somewhat like the movies initially until you start seeing the, the red blood flowing. I realized then that this is what war was really all about. Death is dealt from all sides. Big guns and small fire from Suribachi on the left and the high cliffs on the right. Long-range artillery zeroes in from the far north end of the island. 
This is just the introduction. This is the opening act of one of the toughest battles of World War II. Defense of the island has fallen to General Tadamichi Kurabayashi. He has forbidden the suicide bonsai attacks that have characterized previous island fighting in the Pacific. He asks his men instead to hunker down. He distributes a vow among them that no man must die until he has killed 10 Americans. Iwo represented the front door to the Japanese Empire. And the 22,000 or so Japanese on the island knew it was their job to barricade that front door and keep the Marines out until the Japanese homeland could prepare adequate defenses to repel the invasion. The hellish terrain of Iwo Jima favors the defenders. Moving up from the quicksand of the beaches, the ground spreads out into a plateau devoid of cover, where the island's volcanic rock surface makes the digging of foxholes impossible. Further north, fortified ridges overlook a wasteland of interconnecting ravines and crevices. The island has little vegetation and no fresh water. Most of the Japanese are hidden from sight in 16 miles of underground tunnels and catacombs. Built over a span of two years, this marvel of engineering includes 1,500 subterranean rooms and a hospital with a capacity to treat 400 men. The tunnels link countless bunkers, pillboxes, and cave entrances. Iwo Jima is the most heavily defended and fortified island in the world at this time. They could have bombed that place 100 years, and it would have never been enough for the Marine soldiers and sailors who had to assault the beach. 12 PM, two Marines head up from the beach. 23-year-old platoon leader, Lieutenant John Keith Wells, with 21-year-old PFC Don Rule at his side. A troublemaker during training, Rule has surprised Wells by asking to be his runner during the battle. Together, the two men move in close to the rear door of a concrete blockhouse that's under attack by another platoon. Even though we're standing right there, I'm not even sure they could quite see us because their concentration was on this other platoon advancing on them. On the roof, a Japanese machine gun nest swivels to meet the assault. They go up and whoosh, it just mow them down. They kept trying to knock that thing out. And about the time they'd think they had it knocked out, well, they had opened up again. Finally, a Marine manages to drop an incendiary grenade through a hole in the roof. And all of a sudden, that concrete door blew up, and the smoke come out, and you couldn't see the top of them, but you could see those little legs. Wells unleashes an entire clip from his Tommy gun, and Rule lunges forward to finish off a struggling survivor. laid them out for inspection, you know. Not a one got away. Further to the east, 24-year-old Corporal Tony Stein of A Company, 28th Marines, moves in ahead of his pinned down platoon. Oh, he was a tough little guy. He had a big panther tattooed on his arm. Something that none of us ever did in those days, the big tattoos like that. He's advancing on a series of enemy bunkers manned by the Japanese 312th Independent Infantry. Because all of these bunkers in this complex were so, so well concealed that you couldn't see them until you were within just a few hundred yards of them. The Japanese feel secure peering out from their firing slits. But they're about to be challenged by Iwo Jima's one-man wrecking crew. A former paratrooper and veteran of the Solomon Islands campaign, Corporal Stein carries an unusual weapon, the Browning Model 1919A2, AKA the Stinger. It's a machine gun designed to spew lead from a Navy bomber, not from the arm of a charging Marine. But in previous fighting in the Pacific, the Marines had found their usual machine guns unequal to the task. They were too cumbersome, 
requiring a two or three man crew to operate. And at up to 600 rounds per minute, the rate of fire was fast, but not overwhelming. It just so happened during the Solomon Islands campaign that there were plenty of marine dive bombers laying around in kind of junk state. And it didn't take long for a few enterprising marines to come up with the idea of removing an a and 230 caliber air-cooled machine gun from one of the wrecked airplanes and then attempt to modify it for use on the ground as an infantry weapon. The marines added an improvised trigger, the front sight and buttstock from an M1 rifle, the bipod and rear sight from a BAR, and suddenly, they had a handheld light machine gun that could be operated by one man and could tear off over 1,300 rounds per minute. The Stinger was now the deadliest squad automatic weapon in the Marines' arsenal. Stein advances ahead of his platoon until he's within 50 yards of the first bunker. Realizing that the rest of his platoon can't see the target, he decides to flush them out. Stein stood up, firing his stinger from the hip at the bunker. The bunker then sank this insane Marine exposing himself in front of their fire, opened fire, revealing its positions. Stein drops to the ground and zeroes in on the firing slit. The stinger turns the inside of the bunker into a hornet's nest. Each time Stein would give a burst at that bunker, 20 rounds would come through that loop. The Japanese had to be completely surprised. The Japanese had no expectation that American Marine infantrymen would come ashore at Iwo Jima equipped with an individually portable machine gun that fired 1,300 rounds per minute. Stein eviscerates the Japanese defenders. But there's a price to pay for the Stinger's deadly rate of fire. They had this voracious appetite. He could maybe get five or possibly even six bursts out of a 100-round belt. Stein has extra ammo stacked back at the beach, some 500 yards away. If he wants to get reloaded, he has to make a mad dash through enemy fire. He takes off his helmet to lighten his load and removes his shoes so he can move faster through the sand. Iwo Jima's one-man wrecking crew heads out through the enemy kill zone. Iwo Jima, February 19th, 1945. This is one of the most important days of the war in the Pacific since Pearl Harbor. 30,000 U.S. Marines have assaulted the black sand beaches of this volcanic island. 40,000 more Leathernecks wait offshore to join the fight. The Americans have the numbers, but the 21,000 Japanese on the island are well entrenched in a series of underground tunnels, and they're prepared to fight to the death to defend the island and its three critical airfields. It's up to the 28th Marines to cut off Mount Suribachi from the rest of the island. In this sector, A Company's Tony Stein engages a series of Japanese bunkers. He's chewed through all of the ammo he's carrying for his modified aircraft machine gun, the Stinger. He needs to get back to the beach to load up. I did see him running towards the beach barefooted to pick up ammunition. I guess he felt that he could run faster or better or something. Because by that time, the beach was really under heavy fire. On his way to the beach, Stein stops to pick up a wounded Marine and helps him to the rear. He would do this eight times, running to the rear, helmetless and shoeless, carrying a wounded Marine on his shoulder to get more ammunition. Bunker after bunker falls victim to the overwhelming firepower of the Stinger. By the end of the day, Tony Stein has silenced the whole complex and personally accounted for over 20 Japanese dead. It's the kind of bravery that definitely typified what Marines were doing on Iwo Jima on D-Day, February 19, 1945. As darkness falls on D-Day, the 28th Marines have successfully isolated Mount Suribachi. 
It's been a costly day for the Marines. 500 dead, almost 1,800 wounded. It's just a prelude of what's to come. Tomorrow, they will turn south and assault the mountain stronghold. On February 20, the assault on Surabachi begins with a sustained air and artillery attack. It's followed by a day of hard fighting and slow progress by elements of the 5th Marine Division. To the east, Marines of the 4th Division successfully overrun airfield number one. February 21st, 8 a.m. After a day spent in reserve, Lieutenant John Keith Wells and the 42 men of Easy Company's 3rd Platoon prepare to join the assault on Siribachi. The Marine strategy for taking Siribachi was one, to isolate it, two, to surround it, and three, to conquer the heights. Between Lieutenant Wells' Marines and the base of Siribachi, stretches 200 yards of barren wasteland, devoid of any cover and crisscrossed by interlocking fields of fire. On the other side of this no man's land are two large bunkers with a trench running behind, connecting. Beyond that is the imposing fortress of the mountain itself. Like the hideout of a comic book supervillain, the volcanic rock of Siribachi conceals a seven-story underground lair. Everything was connected and honeycombed together. So if the Marines bypassed one position, thinking it was knocked out, they move on to the next position. Meanwhile, the first position comes alive again, and now they're attacked from behind. Roughly 2,000 sons of Japan lurk in Surabachi's dark recesses, well-armed and ready to die for the emperor. Born of fire, the volcano is about to be baptized in blood. Lieutenant Wells is waiting for the arrival of tank support for the impending attack, but there's no sign of the armor. The tanks gave the Marine infantrymen at least a fighting chance to get in close to the bunkers because Marines could do exactly what infantry is supposed to do when they operate in combat with armor, use the tank as a shield. 8.15 a.m., still no tanks. The tanks wouldn't come. And I got on my phone, I want to know why in the hell they didn't come with going to attack. Well, they're back refueling. Wells can wait no longer. He looks out across the 200-yard killing field, gathers himself, and rises to his feet. I didn't give orders to anybody. I just got it and took off running right straight for the base. And they chose, they chose to follow me. The Japanese react quickly to the sudden charge. 90 millimeter mortars rain down from Siribachi. PFC Rule and Sergeant Henry Hansen push ahead past the blockhouses to the trench running behind them. They stuck their head over, and the Japs is in the trench and down there butted heads with, with them. The Japanese toss an explosive charge at Hansen's feet. I don't know what he pitched out, but it was pretty big. And he pitched it out, and when he did, Rule just dived on it. Don Rule steals himself for the blast. And it blew old Rule up in the air. Well, Hansen grabbed him. And when he did, he showed his whole chest was wide open. So I told him to drop Rule, leave him. And, uh, and that was the end of Rule. Yeah. There's no time to mourn. Wells calls forward two men with Browning automatic rifles. They alternate firing and reloading until one of them is killed by a shot from the trench. Wells is anxious to put the two concrete bunkers out of action. 
To do this, he's going to need his flamethrower men. The flamethrower is a horrible weapon. The Japanese hated it. The Marines had it. And the only defense was to get away from it. As the flamethrower men work their way forward, Wells is called over to a shell hole to talk with company command. Suddenly, a jarring blast numbs his senses. His body is peppered with shrapnel. A piece of flesh is torn from his left leg. In his condition, Wells would be forgiven for leaving the field, but he takes a shot of morphine and continues to lead his men. He directs one flamethrower man to torch the bunker on the left. The Japanese in the right bunker keep the Marines away with a steady barrage of rifle fire and grenades. Amid the din of war, Wells hears a low rumbling. And finally, here come the tanks. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Wells directs a tank to blast the stubborn bunker. It takes 19 rounds of 75 millimeter armor-piercing shells to bust through the concrete. A Marine quickly rushes forward, pushes the nozzle of his flamethrower through the perforation, and fires a burst. Three Japanese escape out the rear door, where another flamethrower man turns to his lieutenant with a questioning look. I let him know, yes, it's okay. And of course, he just curled him up like bacon. With the aid of the late arriving tanks, Easy Company continues to press its advantage toward the base of the mountain. Lieutenant Wells hasn't had any food or water or gone to the bathroom in two and a half days. With his energy ebbing, he turns over the platoon to one of his sergeants and finally begins the long, painful crawl back to the rear. Wells began the day with 42 men under his command. Almost half are now either dead or wounded. February 23, 1945. Day four of the assault on Iwo Jima, 8 a.m. With operations against the base of the volcano completed the previous day, a 40-man patrol from E Company climbs to the summit of Suribachi. But it is a mystery why the Japanese didn't come out of the forest and wipe out that entire patrol. It's presumed the Japanese thought that the, the mountain had fallen and many of them were committing suicide or trying to get through the tunnels to get to the north. The Marines carry a small American flag that one of them brought ashore from the transport ship USS Missoula. 10.20 a.m., Old Glory rises above Iwo Jima. Marine photographer Lewis Lowry is on hand to commemorate the moment. Seeing the Americans posing for pictures is too much for the last holdouts of the Japanese garrison. They step from a nearby cave and begin their assault. Iwo Jima, February 23, 1945. It's four days since the American invasion of this critical Pacific island began. The U.S. Marines have already seized one of Iwo's three airfields, but at great cost. Over a thousand Marines have been killed and more than 2,000 wounded. In the south, the 28th Marines have assaulted Mount Suribachi, a 550-foot volcanic peak that holds the island's highest ground. A 40-man platoon has now reached the summit. To the north, the gains are less dramatic. The curving line of Marines pushing up the island from coast to coast has left them just shy of airfield number two. 11 a.m. 
On top of Siribachi, marine photographer Louis Lowry snaps the first historic images of the American flag waving over Iwo Jima. But there's more than photographs being shot on the summit this morning. Japanese soldiers began emerging from caves. They were aware of the flag having been raised, and they began emerging from concealed positions and continuing to fight. One soldier steps from a cave and cracks off a rifle shot. A BAR man retaliates with a long, deadly burst. A second enemy combatant suddenly emerges from the depths of the volcano. A Japanese officer making a headlong charge with a samurai sword. One of the Marines has a clear shot at him with his 45. He pulls the trigger. The gun misfires. The Marine lunges out of the swordsman's path as the rest of his platoon turns into a firing squad. Sword and soldier clatter to the ground. Now grenades spew out from Siribachi's dark caverns. One arcs toward the photographer, Lowry, and he jumps for his life down the side of the volcano. The Marines maneuver toward the cave entrances to terminate the last gasp of resistance on Siribachi with a deadly hailstorm of grenades, entombing 150 Japanese before they have the chance to mount a full-scale assault. It's only after this final bloodletting on Siribachi that a second, larger flag is sent up the mountain and a photographer from the Associated Press snaps the picture that will become the iconic image of the battle and an enduring symbol of victory. More correctly, what it should symbolize is continuing struggle. It's February 23rd. The battle for Iwo Jima will go on for another month. It's the beginning of the battle. It's the beginning of a slogging match that will ultimately result in almost 7,000 dead Marines. The day after the flag raising, the 3rd Marine Division comes ashore, and together with the 4th Marines, they manage to seize airfield number two. As the 4th wheels east into a heavily fortified region known as the Meat Grinder, the 28th Marines turn north from Siribachi to assault up the western side of the island. March 3rd, 1945, 1 a.m. 19-year-old Private John Armendariz is dug in at his company command post. On a hill 20 feet above him, two Marines from Texas are on a perimeter watch. They are 22-year-old Sergeant William Harrow and 19-year-old Private Andrew Carter. 4 a.m. A platoon of 25 to 30 Japanese mass in the dark ravines around them. Their plan is to bust through the perimeter and decimate the company command post. The Japanese knew that if they could overrun a company command post, it was effectively severing the head of that rifle company. And then suddenly you would have a position of 120, 130, maybe 150 Marines who were leaderless. For the Japanese, the odds of success are high. All they need to do is kill the two Texans. Then they will own the high ground above the company command post. From there, it will be a massacre. At 5 a.m., two shadowy figures approach Carter and Harold's foxhole. Carter fires four quick shots from his Garand as Harold wakes up and gets into his fighting position. He looked down to his front and saw two Japanese coming out of a ravine and uh, immediately engaged them with his carving and uh, killed them. I heard a lot of commotion and firing and people yelling and screaming. The Japanese were attacking in force. More Japanese swarm the perimeter. Carter fires his rifle again. It jams and he evacuates down the hill. Carter came down. He wanted another rifle, so uh, he says, can I take yours, John? He says, yeah, go ahead and take it. Carter scrambles back to the top of the hill in time to see a grenade explode, shredding Harold's arm and breaking his leg. Carter jumps back into the hole as two more Japanese soldiers lunge toward them. Carter gets off two rounds, dropping one of the attackers. 
But then his new rifle jams. Snatching up a captured Japanese rifle, he jabs at his attacker with the bayonet, impaling him on the spike. Now a Japanese officer charges in, slashing with a sword. Carter feels the sting of steel against flesh. Harold draws his pistol with his one good hand and squeezes the trigger. Bleeding and exhausted, Harold slumps down into the foxhole to die. He orders Carter to evacuate and save himself. Not content to see him die slowly, another infiltrator activates a grenade and drops it at Sergeant Harrell's feet. March 3rd, 1945. Day 12 of the assault on Iwo Jima. The United States Marines now control two thirds of this vital Pacific outpost one of the final stepping stones on the campaign to assault the Japanese home islands. The construction crews of the U.S. Navy Seabees are already preparing two captured Japanese airfields to receive American fighters and bombers. 5 a.m. On a ridge overlooking his company command post west of airfield number two, Sergeant William Harrow fights to blunt an enemy assault. He loses one hand to a Japanese grenade. And then a second grenade is tossed into his foxhole. Harrow raises his good arm and wounds the enemy grenadier with a shot from his 45. He shoves the grenade out of the hole, finishing off his attacker. But severing his remaining hand in the blast. 20 feet down the hill, Private John Armandares hears Harold's screams. He grabs a carbine and rushes to help. I went up to the hole and he was really bloody and, and, uh, and pain, you can tell. And he was laying like this uh, with two stumps, this stump and this stump here. I said, okay, I'll get you out, I'll get you out. So I started to pull him out fearful that there was other Japanese right the other side of the hole. I got him about halfway out, and then I saw a helmet coming up at the edge of, the, of his hole there. So I pointed the carbine at it. When I saw the eyes, I fired it. The attack on the company command post has proven to be a massacre for the Japanese. Their bodies litter the ridge. Bloodied and battered, the two Texans have stood their ground and held the perimeter. Harrell is still alive, but barely. In the morning, they evacuated him, and around position, they found uh, 12 bodies, Japanese dead soldiers, five of which were directly attributed to his actions. Harrell loses both his hands, but against all odds, he will survive his injuries and return home to Texas. Over the next two weeks, the Marines fight to secure the final airfield and corral General Kurabayashi and the remaining Japanese into a 700-yard-long ravine known as Bloody Gorge. March 25, 1945, the Marines now occupy the entire island and can find no more Japanese forces to attack. It seems the battle has been won. But on Iwo Jima, it's the enemy you can't see that's the most deadly. There are still hundreds of enemy fighters hidden in the catacombs. While the Japanese remnants plot their endgame underground, above ground, a calm has settled over the island. After 35 days of terror, the men of the 5th Pioneer Battalion, a support unit for the 5th Marine Division, feel they can finally relax. 25th March, 1945, the battle was over. No more, we, had, we didn't even hear a, a rifle shot for 24 hours. We were told that the island had been secured and that we would be debarking the island, that half of our unit would go on the 25th, which they did, and the other half would uh, go on the 26th, and I was in the, the latter group. 
fighters and bombers from the Army Air Corps have begun landing on the island to make use of the captured airfields. The pilots and support crews of the 7th Fighter Command have set up a tent city near the western beaches adjacent to airfield number two. The tents are just north of a line where the 5th Pioneer Battalion is still dug in. 12 p.m. An order circulates for the Marines to turn in all ammo in preparation for their departure. The order draws mixed reviews among the men. The island was secured, and we were leaving the island the next day. I frankly uh, didn't feel any qualms about it. We all kept a clip. A clip is about eight rounds. And the hell with them, we're not going to give it to them. 5 AM. As the Americans sleep, the more than 250 remnants of General Kurabayashi's forces prepare to give them one final nightmare. Now, Kuribayashi's goal was to protect the homeland. Now, if he could take out some of the B-29 crews or their pilots, that would be one less plane that's going to drop bombs on Japan. The Japanese all knew they were going to be killed, of course, but they went in heavily armed. Tents full of sleeping airmen provide soft targets for Japanese steel. The Japs ran through those tents and just cut them up with sabers before they even knew they were being attacked. The army of dead enders slices through the Air Force bivouac area like a human samurai sword, cutting down everything in its path. They were slaughtered. Men were grabbing pistols, carbines, fighting with fists. It was very close combat. Sleeping in an abandoned cook's tent, Lieutenant Bob Hansen awakes to the sound of gunfire. As I was crawling uh, out of the tent, I got hit. It felt like my left foot had been blown off because I couldn't feel it. And uh, I reached down and, no, my foot was still there, so I continued to crawl out of the tent. I looked north and saw uh, two Japanese soldiers about 100 uh, feet away. Hansen has a BAR back in the tent, but he had followed orders and turned in the ammo. I could use it for a club, but that would be the only way I could utilize it. They were reloading their weapons. I could hear the click clack. As the Japanese finish reloading, Lieutenant Hansen readies his combat knife. Iwo Jima. March 26th, 1945, 5 a.m. The battle to secure this island is supposed to be over, but someone forgot to tell the Japanese. An attack by a force of more than 200 dead enders has sliced through an encampment of slumbering Air Force personnel. Elements of the attacking force are now only 100 feet from Marine Lieutenant Bob Hansen and he's turned in all of his ammo in preparation for his departure from the island. Gripping his combat knife, Hansen is prepared to go down fighting. I was afraid they were going to come my way, and I knew if they did, why, I was probably a goner, and uh, I was determined to take at least one of them with me if I possibly could. Hansen keeps low to the ground, and the Japanese infiltrators fail to spot him. They move on, taking the attack south toward the lines of the 5th Pioneer Battalion. In one of the foxholes, 20-year-old assistant machine gunner Sammy Bernstein from Connecticut is dug in with his gunner, Arthur Erdman. Arthur Erdman said he's going to get out of the hole and go see what was wrong. I bet he didn't go maybe 10 or 15 feet. He was cut down by a Jap with a saber. That Jap threw a hand grenade at me. I fired twice. That's the only two I can get off. Bernstein draws his combat knife and finishes off his attacker. I just closed my eyes, and that was it, because I figured the hand grenade was going to take us. 
By now, it's clear to the Marines that they are under a full-scale attack. Lieutenant Harry Martin, a platoon leader in C Company, organizes a firing line. Then, four Japanese start hurling grenades from a captured machine gun pit. The Japanese have messed with the wrong Marine. He was angry at these Japanese for killing some of his men. So Harry attacked those with his 45 automatic pistol. Martin wipes them out. Realizing that his lines can't withstand another sustained attack, Martin organizes a charge to meet the Japanese head on. One of the Japanese threw a grenade it exploded near Harry and, and killed him. Martin's death is not in vain. This counterattack that Lieutenant Martin led pushed the Japanese out of the Pioneer's perimeter and back to the original perimeter of the airfield. As the Marines sweep north, a line of Air Corps personnel pushes in from the west. Trapped in the pincer, the remaining Japanese are slaughtered. As day breaks, flamethrower tanks come forward and incinerate any survivors. Private Bernstein is collapsed in his foxhole, dazed by the unexpected violence of the morning. The Japanese grenade is still lying beside him. It never went off. It was a dud. Somebody yelled, Sam, get the hell out of that foxhole. It's all over. It's all over. Get up. For the US Marines, it is mercifully all over. 55 Americans are killed in this last ditch Japanese attack and 119 wounded. 262 Japanese lie dead. Although never proven, some evidence suggests General Kurabayashi himself led the attack before committing ritual suicide. His body is never found. 8 a.m., the capture of Iwo Jima by American forces is declared complete. Arthur Erdman is among the tragic number who died on what would have been their last day on Iwo Jima. Uh, we boarded ship, and we didn't take Arthur with us. We had, we had to leave him behind to be buried on the island. I walked off that island and left the boy there. Six thousand eight hundred twenty-one Americans gave their lives for the eight square miles of Iwo Jima, a small piece of territory with a large place in history. The loss of Iwo Jima basically meant the end of the Japanese Empire. And now the Americans had a base to launch B-29 operations, basically unhindered all across Japan. Uh, the loss of Iwo meant the end of World War II for the Japanese. Among the men of Iwo Jima, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz said, uncommon valor was a common virtue. Of the 82 Marines to receive medals of honor in World War II, 27 were for action in this horrific fight to the death. So they asked me, uh, man, all that fight and everything, how many medals did you get off for Iwo Jima? And I said, I got five. Five, wow, what were they? I said, two arms, two legs, and one head. That was my medals. Battlefield Batan, where a 45 pistol is a weapon of last resort, an instrument of surrender, and the key to salvation. Only weeks after Pearl Harbor, 
the first great battle of World War II begins. And a starving, disease-ravaged army gives all they have until they can give no more. Life and death shootouts. From First Blood in 1942, to the Death March, to the run and gun heroics of the 1945 Great Raid. Moment by moment, and shot by shot, this is Shootout. Raid on the Bataan Death Camp. Luzon, the Philippines, January 30th, 1945, 7.40 p.m. The perimeter of the infamous Japanese POW camp at Cabanatuan explodes with gunfire. A U.S. Army Ranger leaps from a ditch and blows the lock off the front gate. The Ranger strike force storms the camp. We didn't know how many was in the camp. We knew it was probably going to be a good battle. Inside the camp are more than 500 emaciated Allied prisoners, many of them survivors of the infamous Bataan Death March. For the American Avengers, this is a patriotic quest to bring freedom to the remnants of a hard luck fighting force forsaken by their country three years earlier when the Japanese overran the Philippines. Rewind. December 8, 1941. With the American fleet still smoldering in the waters of Pearl Harbor, Japanese bombers unleash the fury of war on the Philippine Islands. The Japanese had set their sights on neutralizing the American presence in the Philippine archipelago, which of course had been property of the United States since 1898 Spanish-American War. The target for the Japanese attack is the island of Luzon, it's the principal island in the Philippine chain, home to the capital city of Manila and the focus of American military power in the archipelago. Japanese air raids quickly decimate the American naval and air corps installations on the island. In late December, General Masaharu Hama prepares to deliver the coup de grace by bringing a 50,000-man invasion force to the shores of Luzon. With over 100,000 troops of their own, the American-led force on Luzon isn't outnumbered, but it is outgunned. We were coming out of a time warp, in effect. The artillery were World War I cannon and even pre-World War I cannon. The rifles were old, the equipment was old, the hand grenades wouldn't explode. We could look at Bataan as the last battle of World War I and the first of World War II. Realizing early on that the Philippines would be difficult to defend against a Japanese attack, the war planners in Washington had sought out an American hero. Retired General Douglas MacArthur answered the call of duty. Commanding his army from headquarters on the fortress island of Corregidor, MacArthur initiates a long-standing war plan for defending the Philippines from Japanese invasion. It's known as War Plan Orange. This plan called for American and Filipino forces to back down a peninsula that was on the western side of Manila Bay, a peninsula that, of course, is called Bataan. Bataan is a jutting landmass of jungle-covered mountainous terrain that, along with Corregidor, guards the entrance to Manila Bay. War Plan Orange dictates that American forces on Luzon will mass here. Their mission? hold out long enough for the American Navy to steam across the Pacific with the men, supplies, and firepower needed to send the enemy packing back to Japan. But there's a big problem with War Plan Orange. Recent world events have convinced President Franklin Roosevelt to focus America's resources on defeating Hitler first. Although the troops don't know it yet, the U.S. Navy will not be coming to the rescue of the men of Bataan. The men on Bataan were living under a false pretense. 
And this went straight up the line of command through General Wainwright, through MacArthur. All of them believed that the United States was going to send reinforcements within uh, four to six weeks. The reality was that there would be no resupply. There would be no reinforcement. And they would have to fight with what they had. Roughly 80,000 American troops make the fighting retreat into the sweltering jungles of Bataan. Among them are thousands of extremely loyal native Filipinos. Many of them serve in the U.S. Army's 10,000-man Philippine Division. This unique force includes one regiment, the 31st, comprised entirely of American soldiers and two regiments, the 45th and 57th, in which American officers command highly trained native soldiers, known as the Philippine Scouts. They were good soldiers. The scouts were very good soldiers. They were a very good army, the best in the world at the time. The scouts were notorious for being outstanding shots. They were very proud of their marksmanship. January 11th, 1942. The marksmanship of the Philippine scouts is about to be put to the test. Japanese forces are closing in on the Aboke Line, an American line of resistance that runs along northern Bataan from the town of Maban in the west through the barrio of Mabatang in the east. The Philippine scouts of the 57th Infantry are placed along the eastern flank, the most likely zone of attack for the Japanese. The scouts have dug foxholes and strung out barbed wire across the front. Their defenses bristle with machine guns, BARs, and rifles. Some of the American officers are concerned about a field of sugarcane to the far left of their lines. With stalks six to seven feet tall, the field provides a concealed avenue of approach for the Japanese that could bring them within 150 yards of the Filipino-American defenses. It provided cover to the enemy. We tried to persuade the regimental commander to let us cut down all of this sugar cane. The regimental commander refuses to clear the field, fearing it will tip off Japanese reconnaissance planes to the location of his lines. Eleven thirty p.m. A battalion from the Japanese 65th Brigade infiltrates through the cane field. They came howling out of the field, <laughs> shouting bonsai, throwing themselves on the wire. The front crackles with a lightning storm of muzzle blasts. The Japanese wither in the crosshairs of the Filipino marksmen. The scouts, being as accurate in their firing, they punished them. As the first wave of Japanese die on the wire, successive waves use their comrades' corpses as bridges to overcome the obstacle. Now, in the confusing darkness, Japanese and Filipinos come face to face. Along the left of the front, across from the cane field, Filipino machine gunner Narcisco Ortolano pours hot lead into the Japanese from his water-cooled 30 caliber. His A gunner was killed. He was manning the weapon by himself and firing into the ranks of the Japanese infantry that was rushing his position. For dozens of the charging enemy, Ortolano's muzzle blast will be the last sight they ever see. As one group of Japanese soldiers rushed him, the weapon jammed. The Japanese infantry that were charging his position very quickly closed the distance with him. Ortolano draws his pistol and jerks the trigger. He killed five of the rushing Japanese in that way. But that wasn't all of them. One of them made a thrust at him with a rifle bayonet. 
The brave Filipino grabs for the rifle, and instantly, his thumb is amputated by the razor-sharp blade. Still, Ortolano hangs tough. He manages to turn the weapon against his attacker and jabs him with the blade. Suddenly, another rifleman slashes at Ortolano with his bayonet. Batan, the Philippines. January 11th, 1942. A joint American and Filipino army of 80,000 is under siege by a smaller but better supplied, better armed force of Japanese invaders. The Japanese already control Manila and most of the island of Luzon, and now the Allies are struggling to hold on to this jungle-infested peninsula. 11.30 p.m. Along the Abuke line, a ferocious Japanese attack has slammed into the entrenched Philippine scouts of the 57th Infantry. PFC Narcisco Ortolano's machine gun jams, so he resorts to his pistol and then his bare hands. Ortolano manages to turn the weapon against his attacker and jab him with the blade. Now another rifleman slashes at him. Ortolano yanks the bayonet from the dead man's corpse, swings the rifle over, and drops the enemy soldier. Up and down the scout lines, the men have shown the same stubborn refusal to give any ground to the Japanese. Daybreak reveals a battlefield strewn with the bodies of the dead and those who refused to die. The next day, Ortolano was found by his machine gun, badly wounded but still alive, and he was subsequently awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for the action. After another night assault on January 12th, the Japanese give up trying to breach the lines of the Philippine scouts. They move their attack west to try their luck against the less formidable troops of the Philippine army. This was the first serious battle fought by the Filipino scouts in the Bataan campaign. A lot of hope had been placed on their soldierly abilities and that hope was realized. Despite the bravery of the Philippine scouts, by February, the defense of Bataan is beginning to look like a lost cause. Continued Japanese pressure forces the retreat of the U.S.-led forces into the southern third of Bataan. Jungle illnesses like malaria and dysentery run rampant among the troops, and supplies are running out. Dealing with shortages of fresh water, but then more importantly, food. Without enough food, they couldn't last forever. The Filipinos were starving, the Americans were starving, people were sick as dogs, maybe 10% of the people were still partially healthy. On March 11th, the already suffering troops receive a hammer blow to their morale when General MacArthur evacuates the Philippines for the safety of Australia. The United States felt they could not lose such a significant figure to the Japanese. So Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to leave the Philippines, and MacArthur reluctantly did so. When MacArthur finally did leave Corregidor, he promised to the men on Bataan that he would return. That is the famous, I shall return. The War Department turns over command of the Philippines to General Jonathan Wainwright, who in turn places General Edward King in charge of the roughly 75,000 holdouts on Bataan. On April 3rd, Japanese General Hama prepares his men to move in for the kill. Bringing in thousands of reinforcements, he plans to finish off the Filipino-American army by taking Mount Samat, a 2,000-foot high mountain from which he can launch a final drive southeast toward Manila Bay and Corregidor. If this plan succeeds, it will bring the Battle of Bataan to a bloody close. April 5th, 1942. With Philippine Army units falling back in the face of the Japanese attack, General King orders his reserve units forward. Among them are the soldiers of the 31st Infantry. 
The men have already suffered heavy losses from combat, starvation, and disease. B Company, normally around 200 strong, now has only 32 men left. April 6th. Hidden within a thicket of bamboo on Mount Samad, Private Houston Turner is in B Company's command post. His first sergeant surveys the area. He said, Jesus Christ, he said, you ought to see those damn Japs coming down that hill. I took a look too. They were like ants coming down that hill. I said, man, we're not gonna be able to handle this. Just then, a mortar blast rocks the CP. Turner is unscathed, but he's the only lucky one. The two sergeants are dead. The company commander has a bloody shoulder wound. And the company's runner has the calf of one leg nearly blown off. He was yelling and every time he'd yell while they throw another mortar at us. So the company commander said, shut him up or kill him. So I took my gun and I stuck it to the head. I said, hey, you shut up or I'm gonna pull the trigger on you. He did, he shot up. The CO orders Turner to evacuate the injured runner while he tries to organize the rest of the company for a retreat. We came out and I had this guy on my arm. I, I wasn't really paying any attention because I was concerned with him and his bad leg. Next thing I looked up and God, they were all around us. A rifleman fires a shot from point blank range, narrowly missing Turner. And I had my M1 and I wheeled it around and you get off eight rounds and the quick as you could pull the trigger. Turner fights off several more of the enemy. Then turns back to the wounded man. With the Japanese advancing all around him, Turner faces an agonizing decision. Risk death or capture carrying the injured runner out of the jungle, or leave the man behind and save himself. There's no one to talk to. There's no chain of command nearby. It's hot, it's dangerous. The Japanese are right over the next hill. Fire's coming in. There's not much you can do. You have to leave the man and you have to leave. I told this guy, you know, hey, you're on your own, man, because I'm, this is survival we're talking about here. I took one off, and that's the last I saw him or heard of him. So I'm sure he didn't make it. I'm pretty sure he bled to death. I didn't know the guy personally, but he was an American, so he meant something to me, that's for sure. With his army on Bataan in complete collapse, General King faces an agonizing decision of his own. Does he sit back and watch what's left of Philippine and American armies get completely destroyed? Or does he surrender them to the Japanese and hope that the Japanese will at least give them a level of humane treatment? It had to have been a terrible, terrible decision to have to contemplate. And of course, in the end, he does make the decision to surrender American and Philippine forces to the Japanese. April 9th, 1942. On the 77th anniversary of Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, the Filipino-American force on Bataan lays down its arms and stumbles out of the jungle. 70,000 men turn themselves over to the Japanese in the largest surrender ever by an American army to a foreign power. But not everyone is ready to give up the fight. Some men, like Houston Turner, refuse surrender and take to the hills. Private Turner heads off alone into a jungle that's crawling with enemy troops. I went on up the trail. As I came around the corner, I saw Japanese in a uniform there. So I ducked back, and he saw me, and he ducked back. So I thought, oh, the war's gonna start all over again here. So then I looked back around again, and he looked around again. 
that, well, I'll give him a big surprise the next time he looks around. When he did, I threw about eight or nine rounds in there. One threat is eliminated, but sensing there are enemy eyes all around him, Turner looks for an avenue of escape. He heads toward a narrow canyon that leads downhill. As he nears the bottom of the hill, a platoon of Japanese gunmen opens up on him from below. I had cover, so I'd shoot back just to keep him down. Bullets shred the jungle canopy. Turner's heart is pounding. Suddenly, shots ring out from the hill behind him. And I thought, oh Christ, and now I'm surrounded. Bataan, the Philippines, April 1942. With supplies running out and the army decimated by disease and starvation, American General Edward King decides to surrender rather than let his troops be massacred by the invading Japanese. Most of the Allied troops, some 70,000 men, have now become prisoners of war. But Private Houston Turner has refused to surrender, and he's taken to the hills to fight on. The enemy has him surrounded. Below him are dozens of Japanese troops. Above him, a single gunman. I heard some shooting above me. So I worked towards where he was shooting because I figured one gun is not going to be like 20 they got over there. He's relieved to find it's a Filipino, not a Japanese. He said, you was in trouble, huh? And I said, yeah, big trouble. I said, there's a lot of Japs down there, man. And he said, yeah, I'll help you out. By now, the firing from below has quieted down, and the Filipino wants to move on. Turner convinces him to stay put and fight it out. Better to finish this battle now than have the Japanese platoon stalk them through the jungle. We sat there about five, six minutes. And sure enough, they came out and they started down that hill. And I said, let them get about halfway down. The two men unload on the Japanese platoon. When the firing stops, there are 16 lifeless corpses on the jungle floor. Turner and his Filipino brother-in-arms slip away into the mountains. After two weeks, Turner comes down with a life-threatening case of malaria. Not to have his chills and fever. So I told him, look, you go ahead. His name was Lavardus. I said, you go ahead and I'll just turn myself in because I'm not gonna make it with this malaria. I told him, you know, nice to know him and take it, you know, be careful. Turner walks down out of the jungle and surrenders himself to the first Japanese unit he can find. Battlefield Bataan has claimed another American fighting man. The Japanese are struggling to move the thousands of surrendered Americans and Filipinos to a POW compound at Camp O'Donnell in central Luzon. They don't have enough trucks to transport the prisoners. So the already starving and sick troops are forced to endure a 60-mile march north through the sweltering jungle. During this march, the Japanese exacted the American and Filipino survivors to absolute brutality and cruelty, leading ultimately to this march being called the Bataan Death March. Soldiers too exhausted to keep up are bayoneted or shot. If a man breaks ranks for a drink of water, he's instantly executed. First time I seen a guy beat to death, a guy hit him with a pick handle. His eye fell right out like the cat had been run over on the road. I never wanted to kill anybody so bad in my life as I did them. 
Hundreds of Americans and as many as 10,000 Filipinos perish on the long road out of Bataan to the internment camp. The atrocities only continue once the men reach Camp O'Donnell. And I never saw such a sight in my whole life. They had people hanging by the neck. They had them hanging by the thumb. Camp commander said, you Americans are dogs, and we're going to treat you like dogs. They never fed us. We didn't have nothing to eat for about three days. I said, we got to eat, man. I was eating the leaves off of the trees around there. Between April and June, 1,500 Americans and 20,000 Filipinos perish in Camp O'Donnell. In June, Turner and the rest of the Americans are moved to another prison camp at Cabanatuan, joining prisoners from the recently surrendered garrison of Corregidor. For some, like Turner, Cabanatuan is only a stopping off point before they are shipped to work camps elsewhere in the empire. For others, this is the end of the line, the place where they will sit out the rest of the war, holding out for rescue, awaiting death. Fast forward three hellish years. January 9th, 1945. The tide of the war in the Pacific has turned against the Japanese. General Douglas MacArthur splashes ashore on the Philippines, fulfilling an almost three-year-long quest to battle back to the islands he had been forced to abandon. While MacArthur has been racking up victories and grabbing headlines, the Allied prisoners of war at Cabanatuan have toiled in obscurity for three dismal years. More than 500 sick and starving men continue to fester in Luzon's tropical heat. They have little food, inadequate medical care, and dwindling reserves of hope. The ultimate survivors, some of these POWs are the last men standing from the infamous Bataan Death March. The decision was made to send a strike force to attempt to liberate the prisoners that were there. The force that was chosen was none other than U.S. Army Rangers, Rangers of the 6th Ranger Battalion. They were under the command of a fellow who was known as Little MacArthur by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Musi. Musi was told about the camp and what little bit of information that they had as far as intelligence and was told to organize a raid to retrieve these four to 600 POWs. Musi chooses C Company's Captain Robert Prince as the assault commander. Once the recon platoon gathers intelligence on the layout of the camp, it will be his job to come up with a plan for assaulting the compound. January 27th. Musi and Prince gather their men and outline the mission. From his battalion of 800 rangers, Musi selects the 90 men of C Company, reinforced by a 30-man platoon from F Company and a small contingent of reconnaissance specialists known as the Alamo Scouts. That is a very small force going up against uh, what could have been seven to 8,000 Japanese that were in the immediate area. Colonel Moose had told us it was necessary. He wanted us to give our life to be sure that prisoners were safe or the people were safe. I said, I'm, I'm going to turn around. I want every man who wants to go on this raid, I want them to take one step forward. They all step forward. They wanted the chance to do this. I was willing to give my life if necessary to see that those prisoners were set free. Guided by local Filipino guerrillas, the Rangers will have to infiltrate 30 miles into hostile territory to reach the prison camp, which is located in a sector swarming with enemy troops. There are 1,000 Japanese on the banks of the Kabu River, only a mile east of the camp. 
seven to 9,000 more troops are believed to be in Cabanatuan City, four miles down the road to the west. Roughly 300 enemy forces are bivouacked in the buildings of the camp itself. Even if the Rangers manage to free the POWs, they'll still face a 30-mile march back to friendly lines with 500 emaciated prisoners in tow. Just one Philippine traitor could have betrayed the entire plan. All of them, plus all of the prisoners, would have been massacred right on the spot. January 28th, 2 p.m. The Rangers set off on the most dangerous mission of their lives. Luzon, the Philippines. January 28, 1945. An elite force of more than 100 Army Rangers infiltrates behind enemy lines. Their mission, assault the Japanese prison camp at Cabanatuan and liberate 500 Allied POWs. We had to go through rice paddies. They were dried up. The weather was hot. We had to go 30 miles at night. It was hot then, even. Escorting the Rangers is a band of 80 Filipino guerrilla fighters under the command of Captain Eduardo Hoson. They're the ones that led us in. They knew that territory, where to march, where to avoid a lot of snakes, where to cross rivers. Soon, another local guerrilla group joins the throng. Captain Juan Pajoda brings roughly 200 men from his personal militia. Assault Commander Captain Bob Prince lays out his plan for the lightning raid. We drew in the mud a sketch of what we thought the POW or camp looked like and where the people were. The camp is 800 yards deep and 600 yards wide. The American prisoners are housed in the northeast sector, to the left of the main gate, with the Japanese barracks spread throughout the rest of the camp. At dusk the following day, C Company will crawl up and position themselves near the front gate. Meanwhile, F Company will fan out along the side and rear of the camp. At precisely 7.30 p.m., F Company will kick off the assault. They'll knock out the perimeter guards and destroy the Japanese army barracks. When Prince hears F Company's first shots, C Company will take out the guards at the front of the camp, then jump up and assault the main gate. One platoon will head up the central road, take out the troops in the Japanese officers' quarters, and destroy a shed that houses enemy tanks. C Company's second platoon is assigned a special mission they were not to fight. They were to go in and get the POWs. As the Rangers storm the camp, the two bands of Filipino guerrillas will have their back. Captain Hoson's forces will set up a roadblock to the west to hold off enemy troops that might advance from Cabanatuan City. Captain Pajoda's men will set up their roadblock to the east, sealing off the road near the Cabu River Bridge to prevent the thousand-man force camped by the river from joining the battle. January 30th, 5.45 p.m. The Filipinos establish their roadblocks. A demolitions expert creeps forward and attaches a time bomb to the bottom of the Cabu River Bridge. He sets the timer for 7.45 p.m. At the same time, the Rangers begin a slow crawl forward through a dried up rice paddy. We had to crawl about three quarters of a mile through rice paddy. We could see the guard towers around the camp. We were afraid we'd get spotted. A Japanese guard in one of the towers raises his rifle, and the rangers are sure they've been spotted. Captain Prince had said that if we get spotted, we're going to charge the camp. We're not going to back down. We're going to go forward. The rangers hug the ground and prepare to fire. 
But before any bullets fly, the sentry in the tower lowers his guard. It's a close call, and the rangers realize that to get any closer to the fence without being spotted, they're going to need some help from above. Luckily, Colonel Musi has radioed for a flyover by an American aircraft, not for an airstrike, but as a diversion. P-61 Black Widow, one of the sexiest airplanes of the Second World War. This was an American twin-engine night fighter that flew and performed this little ballet directly over the camp. For about 20 or 30 minutes, it came back and forth, back and forth over the camp. This distracted all of the guards. Everybody was looking up instead of out. This allowed the Americans to crawl forward into a ditch right at the edge of the camp within just a few yards of the front gate. 7.30 PM, zero hour for the assault. C Company is in position, but they're waiting for F Company to kick off the action from the rear. The minutes ticked by, the tension was unbelievable as these men from C Company lay just within 20 to 30 feet of Japanese sentries. I was getting pretty nervous because I figured we might have to start it whether they were in position or not. 7.40 p.m. F Company is finally in position. The platoon leader aims his M1 into the Japanese guard tower and pulls the trigger. There was an absolute barrage of small arms fire. One of the guards in the guard tower actually disintegrated from the shoulders up. The guard in the second guard tower was cut completely in half, and the top of him fell over, toppled on the ground, smoking. With the guards in the towers eliminated, two rangers rush the main gate. T.R. Richardson hammers the lock with his Tommy gun. When that doesn't work, he draws his pistol. A shot from inside the camp blows the pistol out of his hand. Cabanatuan, the Philippines, January 30th, 1945. 7.40 p.m. Desperate to rescue 500 emaciated Allied POWs, 120 U.S. Army Rangers begin their assault on the infamous Japanese prison camp at Cabanatuan. Ranger T.R. Richardson tries to blow the lock off the front gate, but a lucky shot from inside the camp knocks the weapon from his hand. Richardson quickly unleashes a burst from his Tommy gun, cutting down the advancing Japanese guard. Another ranger hands over his 45, and Richardson finally blasts open the lock. The rangers charge into the camp. As they began running down the street, they were open fire on anything and everything on the Japanese side. Company's first platoon makes a beeline for the Japanese officers' quarters toward the rear of the camp. I don't think any Japanese could have survived the amount of firepower that was put on their barracks, just unloaded on them with everything they had. And they just devastated that area. Now the bazooka team streaks toward the tank shed. Just as they started to set up on the tank shed, they saw a truck full of Japanese coming around the corner. The Rangers adjust their targets. A rocket hurtles down the street, scoring a direct hit on the truck. Japanese came piling out of the back. They were cut down. The Rangers unleash another rocket and destroy the tank shed. The overwhelming firepower from the Americans has surprised the Japanese and prevented them from mounting an organized counterattack. 
The only real threat to the mission now are the enemy troops outside the camp. 7.45 p.m., the Filipino time bomb explodes right on schedule. It splinters the bridge, but leaves enough of the planking that the Japanese are able to mount a charge on foot. Pahota's men unleash on them. No telling how many they killed at that one place. They stacked them up like cordwood. Inside the camp, the second platoon busts into the POW barracks. To them, it was like people from Mars. The POWs did not recognize the weaponry. They did not recognize the type of uniform. The confused prisoners fear this is all just a Japanese plot to execute them. Some of the prisoners even tried to get away from them because they did not understand that they were being liberated. One POW refuses to follow the Rangers out. He said, I'm not going out of this camp. He said, I never saw anything as ugly as these uniforms. You're not American. We said, you're going out or we're going to kick you out. Finally got them started out. 8.15 PM, Captain Prince orders his men to pull back. The POWs stream away from the camp. They were skin and bones. You could reach around the calves of the leg with your hand. They were in just shorts, just underwear. A lot of them had malaria, dysentery, everything you could think about. In an almost biblical exodus, the men of Cabanatuan roll, march, and stagger slowly toward freedom. The Japanese failed to give chase. I think somebody was looking down above to see that those men that had suffered so long were set free. After 14 grueling hours, the mile-long procession safely reaches American lines. It was a big celebration. Oh, it was a thrilling moment. You don't know how we felt when we saw these people free. The greatest experience I ever had in my life. The battle for Bataan has come full circle. 500 men abandoned by their country three years earlier will live to see home. The Japanese are in retreat and in a matter of months, it will be their turn to wave the white flag. Although Bataan remains the largest surrender in American history, the ill-fated defense in early 1942 played a vital role in the outcome of the Pacific War. When the Japanese had their great chance to run wild in the Pacific, they got stopped and slowed down at Bataan. Our forces ultimately had to surrender there, but it cost the Japanese dearly. Radioing Washington in January 1942, General MacArthur paid fitting tribute to the fighting men of Bataan. No troops have ever done so much with so little. I bequeath to you the charge that their fame and glory be duly recorded by their countrymen. This program contains real and reenacted violent combat scenes. Viewer discretion is advised. You thought you've heard and seen it all. But it's only the beginning. There wasn't a day that didn't go by that we didn't fire our weapons. The anatomy of the soldiers and high-tech weapons from the mother of all urban battles. We trained to win the 10-second gunfight. It was crazy, and I had never seen anything like it. It's the ultimate battle zone. 
shootout. Return to Fallujah. November 8, 2004, Fallujah, Iraq. It's 21st century warfare. High tech, no holds barred. Sheer hell. We could do the job, you know, we can kick ass and take names, bottom line. You see me, I see you. Who can shoot fastest is the guy that wins. A guerrilla force, imported and homebred, terrorizes the city with an arsenal of deadly weaponry. American forces step in to reclaim the city for the Iraqi people. The motivation of the insurgency is an important factor. You get a very volatile mix of extremist religious fervor with rejectionist elements who are clearly here to work against the coalition. Along with the Marines, the Army plays a crucial role in the invasion. They bring the big armor, including Abrams tanks, whose 120 millimeter main guns provide shock effect to spearhead the attack. The Army's 2nd Battalion, 2nd Regiment, also known as Task Force 2-2, slices deep into the southeastern corner of the city the first two days. The mechanized force proves they're a formidable fighting machine. November 10th, 1.45 a.m. Third Platoon Alpha Company advances toward a block of 13 homes where there have been reports of enemy activity. They approach the 10th house. They enter the building and stack themselves along a living room wall, ready to charge into the next room. As I started to turn the corner, the insurgents started firing. Staff Sergeant David Bellavia enters the funnel of the doorway and pumps rounds towards the insurgents' positions. He suppressed them enough that that squad was able to break contact and, and move out behind him. And then once the last man was out, Sergeant Bellavia left the room as well. As 3rd Platoon regroups outside, Bellavia calls for the M2A2 Bradley fighting vehicle. Its main weapon is a 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannon, which can fire 200 rounds per minute. The vehicle is also equipped with a 7.62 millimeter machine gun and a tow missile system. The Bradley unleashes 25 millimeter cannon fire into the house. But the vehicle is so close to the courtyard wall that its barrel cannot point down to cause maximum damage to the first floor. But the impact were enough they thought that perhaps the insurgents had either broken contact or might be disoriented enough that they could get back in. 29-year-old Bellavia gears up to go back into the house. He posts two gunners in the courtyard. Then he enters the house with an embedded journalist. He goes into the first room where the guys have been trapped initially. As he looks around the corner, he sees one of the insurgents prepping a, a RPG. His thought was, I need to eliminate that threat immediately. Bellavia turns the corner and swiftly terminates the insurgent. Another insurgent emerges from behind the staircase barrier and fires an RPK light machine gun, spraying 600 7.62 millimeter rounds per minute toward the soldiers. Bellavia returns fire and strikes him in the shoulder. The wounded insurgent retreats to a back kitchen. Staff Sergeant Lawson hears the gunfire. He enters the room with Bellavia. 
armed with a 9mm Beretta, Lawson fires into the kitchen, where the wounded combatant returns AK-47 fire. Lawson empties his clip. He's left with one 9mm magazine, which doesn't have enough rounds and firepower to stand up against the enemy's AK. Lawson exits the house to retrieve an M16 and a shotgun. The embedded journalist also leaves to retreat from the line of fire. There was no turning back. He had to, he had to continue on and continue on on his own. Bellavia now faces a bedroom and hears noises inside. As he turns into this room, he's kind of shooting into the corners in the dark because he had heard noise in there. Bellavia scans the room with his PEQ-2A infrared target laser. He notices a six-door wardrobe closet. Bellavia systematically pumps fire into each closet door. Before finishing, he hears more screaming from outside the bedroom. The guy in the kitchen actually comes out and starts shooting at him. At the same time, another guy comes down the stairs. And so he is forced into this room, and he's kind of taking cover inside the room now, firing back out. He's able to shoot both the guy coming out of the kitchen and the guy in the stairwell. Bellavia has neutralized three insurgents. But suddenly, behind Staff Sergeant Bellavia, an insurgent emerges from the wardrobe closet. November 10th, 2004, Battle for Fallujah. Six battalions of U.S. forces, supported by Iraqi troops, continue to slug it out with insurgents as they sweep halfway through the city. The lead battalions, 27, 18, and 22, are on Route Michigan, the main road that cuts across the city from east to west. Task Force 22's 3rd Platoon Alpha Company attempts to clear a block of 13 homes. As they enter the 10th house, they are met with enemy fire. Three soldiers guard the courtyard, while Staff Sergeant David Bellavia re-enters the house with an embedded reporter. Bellavia kills an insurgent prepping an RPG and wounds another. Staff Sergeant Scott Lawson enters, but he eventually leaves to retrieve more weapons, as does the reporter who retreats from the line of fire. Bellavia is the only one left in the house. Two more insurgents appear. Bellavia kills both of them. Suddenly, a combatant emerges from a wardrobe closet, pumping AK-47 fire. So Bellavia backs into the far corner, and as this guy jumps out, the whole wardrobe kind of tumbles down after him. The combatant leaps over the bed. Bellavia riddles him with bullets. The enemy manages to flee the room. So Bellavia comes out of the room, looks up the stairs, and they exchange gunfire. Bellavia ran up the stairs. He knew the guy was in the room. So Bellavia took a grenade and threw it into the room. Bellavia enters the smoky room with a grenade detonated. The insurgent actually was able to exit the room out onto the roof when the grenade went off. So the Bellavia looks into the room. The guy is coming back from the roof or patio back into the room, and he's, you know, trying to get his weapon up the fire. Probably a little disoriented, you know, from the, the blast, but still on his feet. And so Bellavia shoots him. And he ran out of ammo. 
this guy still trying to fight? And the guy's yelling to someone upstairs. Bellavia probably correctly assumes that the guy's trying to give him Bellavia's position. Bellavia has no time to reload. And that's when he had to go hand to hand. After a violent struggle, Bellavia silences the threat. He used a knife to kill him. Bellavia now reloads and moves to clear two doors to his right. Suddenly, a fifth insurgent jumps from a third floor roof down onto the second floor patio. Bellavia moves toward the window and squeezes off multiple rounds. The insurgent tumbles off the patio and disappears. Bellavia emerges with cuts, scratches, and bruises. And I told Sergeant Bellavia, you're a, you're a freaking warrior, man. And I told him, I thank you for what you did. You'll probably save the lives of a lot of his men in, in doing that. Bellavia is now a civilian and an activist for Veterans Affairs. Five a.m., November thirteenth, two thousand four. Battle for Fallujah. Task Force Two Two is still conducting house cleaning, but it's a relatively quiet morning. Alpha Company Commander Sean Sims rolls into a neighborhood in southern Fallujah. Corporal Travis Barreto and Specialist Joe Seaford act as personal security attachment for Commander Sims. I don't know of anybody who has anything negative to say about him. He was the man. I mean, and he was smooth. He was sharp. He knew what he was doing. Family-oriented man. Loved his wife, loved his kids. All around great guy. He believed in the mission. He believed in actually helping the Iraqi people. Captain Sims assembles his security attachment and an Air Force sergeant who will act as a forward observer. They are scouting for a rooftop to serve as an observation post. Sims selects a building, which he believes is in a relatively secure area. There was friendlies all around us. That's why I believe that Captain Sims wanted to go in that building. I think that he felt safe. Um, and he was also told that first platoon had spent the night in that building the night before. I said, sir, you know, you want me to send a squad with you? Cam Sims was like, no, no, it's OK, I'll be fine. I was like, sir, are you sure? He's like, no, I have my guys. You know, the, his uh, headquarters platoon, his, his own, like, personnel, security detachment, they're always going with him. They approach the building, which stands extremely close to another building on its right. A narrow alleyway runs between the two structures. He wanted me to go to the building on the left, and he told me, you know, I'll meet you on the top. Armed with a 9 millimeter, Barreto scales the building to the right. Once on the roof, Barreto jumps across to the building where Captain Sims and the others plan to enter. And there was a hole in the roof where there were stairs that went down. So I was just standing there, making sure nobody came to the roof. Captain Sims, Seaford, and the Air Force Sergeant, in that order, enter the building. Seaford's armed with an M249 squad automatic weapon. SAW, as it's commonly called, is a light machine gun. It carries a 200-round drum and can fire a lethal 750 rounds per minute. Captain Sims happened to be the first one to enter the building. We entered the room. He gave me the hand signal to uh, clear that room. It didn't look like a very big room. Seaford enters the room. 99.99% .99 of the time that we cleared rooms, we never ran into action. But this time, the odds are stacked against him. Two insurgents emerge and open fire. November 13th, 2004. Battle for Fallujah. 
American forces have been fighting in Fallujah for one week. Six battalions continue to battle their way into the city. 10.30 a.m. Alpha Company Commander Sean Sims of Task Force 2-2 has selected a building to serve as an observation post. The house that he went in, we occupied the night prior. It was one of our uh, houses that we'd been in, so he moved in with the security element. Captain Sims feels secure clearing the building with his small security attachment. From the outside, Corporal Travis Barreto climbs to the rooftop and waits for the others to join him. As the rest of the team enters the building, Captain Sims orders Specialist Joe Seaford to clear the room on the right, while he continues down the hall with the Air Force Sergeant. At the end of the room, kind of just went in and uh, scanned and turned and there were two insurgents hidden under a blanket. The insurgents clutch AK-47s, which can fire 600 rounds per minute at a range of over 300 yards. And they came out firing. The insurgents unleash their AK-47s from eight feet away. Seaford returns fire with his saw and fatally wounds the insurgents. Suddenly, a bullet rips through Seaford's left shoulder. We both hit each other uh, about the same time. And uh, was in shock, maybe for a second, but, you know, like I said, then that fight or flight kicks in. That's when uh, I attacked him with my weapon. As Seaford turns to leave, an AK-47 bullet clips the back of his left leg. I was, uh, you know, kind of crawling down the hallway. At that point, I was uh, yelling for Sergeant Barreto. And all I heard was gunfire. And then the next thing I heard was Seaford uh, scream my name, and I jumped down from the roof. Barreto grabbed Seaford near the front door. Threw him over the little cinder block wall in the alleyway. I put him down, and I went and peeked. And that's when they lobbed the grenade. Barreto takes cover before an enemy grenade detonates. Barreto now sees the Air Force sergeant leaning against a wall, injured from a ricochet bullet. He looked a little dazed and I said, you all right? He was like, no, I'm, I'm hit, you know. Taking it like a champ, you know. Give him a lot of credit and then, sure, was, sure enough, he had a, a bullet hole in his shoulder. Barreto realizes Sims is still in the house. And I was yelling Captain Sims' name the whole time, no answer. The first platoon sergeant arrives. Barreto motions that Captain Sims is still inside while he drags his wounded comrades to the Bradley. The first platoon squad enters the house. The insurgents toss grenades and then disappear. The squad moves past the room where Seaford and the enemy exchanged fire. They were yelling his name. At that point, I realized he was, uh, he was gone. They find Captain Sims killed in action. I see Captain Sims in the back of one of the Bradleys. We talk about one of the most outstanding leaders that I've, I've ever worked under. I just couldn't believe it. I just started thinking, man, he's not gonna see his son grow up. Nobody really wanted to talk about it because we knew what we had to do and we had to complete the mission. And like I said, to, uh, to have done any less would have, would have, would have been to let Sean down. We couldn't let that happen. Task Force 2-2 isn't the only Army regiment facing close quarter combat. That same moment, more than two miles to the west, Alpha Company 2nd Battalion 7th Cavalry Regiment faces the fight of their lives. 
the infantrymen roll into Shuhada, known as the Martyr's Neighborhood. It's located in the southwestern section of Jolan, a hotbed of enemy resistance. For Specialist Jose Velez, Fallujah will be his first mission in Iraq. Velez was always one of those that was right there with us, always wanting to be in the middle. Of, not so much trying to be in the middle of the action, but he wasn't going to let none of us like go out there alone either. He always tried to bring out the best in the worst situations. A squad searches the neighborhood for weapons and insurgents. Sergeant Akram Abdu'Wahab, better known as Abe, is the point man. We were clearing houses behind a mosque, and as we were taking detainees, the guy across the street fired off a couple of rounds at us. My squad leader, Sergeant Santiago, rallied up our squad, and we decided to go chase after the guy. The squad approaches the house where the insurgent is thought to be. It's a two-story gray dwelling, not as nice as the rest of the homes on the block. The seven-man stack first clears the house directly to the left. But no insurgents are found. It is assumed the enemy must be in the house directly to the right. So the squad lines up on the courtyard wall adjacent to the target home. Everybody just got this feeling like, oh crap, this, this is actually the building that they're in. And he more than likely knows you're coming and he's already set up some kind of defense in that building. We basically got online, stacked up, everybody ready to go. Threw two grenades over the wall, boom. Ran around out of one courtyard into the other courtyard. Sergeant Abdullah was the lead, and he just went straight into the building. The first door that I came to was the kitchen door. I ran up the wall. Specialist Howard ran up. And I told Howard I saw a guy on the far end of the next room standing beside a window. And there was another guy under the stairs right across from him. And I signaled to Howard that I was going to take the guy on the far window. He was to take the guy underneath the stairwell. And as soon as I started popping off rounds, the guy under the stairwell started shooting at Howard. The rest of the squad pulled back out of the room since it was such a small room. It was a good, easy kill zone. From then on, me and Abe kind of got pinned in the room for the next few minutes. The rest of us just took up positions in all the windows and started firing back into the house. I saw fire coming out of there, bullets. I could feel things going past my head. Everybody was shooting, focused on that one house. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a lone sniper starts firing at the squad from the second floor of the building, directly across the street. Specialist Jose Velez spins around and sprays the house with his M249 saw. As soon as he joined in with us for Fallujah, it was like, I didn't have to train him up on nothing. He's one of the better guys because he realized what the situation was. While Velez fires at the sniper across the street, Abe and Howard continue to take out insurgents inside the house. As we were engaging people, more people kept coming in from back behind the house. As they were coming in, myself or Howard was popping them. We took out about 15 insurgents, and we started throwing grenades. They started throwing grenades. A grenade came into the room, and I yelled grenade, told Howard to get out. I pulled back out of the room got out that front door, 
turned around and Abe wasn't behind me. I was tucked in on the wall. The grenade went off. I went back around the corner, started shooting some more, and tossed one of my grenades. And whoever was on the other side of the wall threw my grenade back in at me. That one broke my right leg. At this point, you know, adrenaline's going. I didn't, I didn't feel anything. I went back around the corner, started shooting some more. Now alone in the house, Abe has sustained two grenade blasts. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, a third grenade lands just inches away. November 13th, 2004, Shuhada, AKA Martyr's Neighborhood, located in the southwestern section of Jolan. Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, punctures into the heart of the city and now find themselves in a hot zone. Staff Sergeant Carlos Santiana and his squad attempt to clear a house where an insurgent is thought to be hiding. The squad no sooner knocks down the front door than they realize they've entered a deadly ambush. Sergeant Abe Abdulwahab and Specialist Wayne Howard kill over a dozen insurgents, while the rest of the squad fires from outside. Abe tells Howard to leave, while he takes the brunt of not one, but two grenades. With his adrenaline in overdrive, Abe continues to lay fire. On the back around the corner, got a couple more guys. They threw a third grenade in. I said, I got to go. But Abe can't escape in time. That one peppered my right leg. I managed to stumble my way to the door and fell. I couldn't get back up. And I was yelling for help. I was pulling him out. He still had the rifle up shooting at the door, even though he was on the ground. I pulled him out of the courtyard, got in front of the brick wall, thinking there'd be good cover there. And that's when we found out there was a sniper across the street shooting at us. He got shot in the shoulder, dropped me. He grabbed me with his other arm and kept pulling me. I'm still laying down cover fire. At the time, I didn't even realize I'd actually gotten hit. I never really knew what happened until I lost the use of my arm because it lost so much blood. Directly above them, Specialist Jose Velez continues to fire at the sniper across the street. Velez was standing over us at our feet, firing. I don't know where the other guys were at. The rest of us were trying to reorganize and figure out how we're going to enter this house. Back at the entrance to the home, Staff Sergeant Carlos Santiana and his men configure a new plan of attack. But just then, two grenades roll out the front door. Everybody dropped down to the ground and started moving as fast as they could away. And then I'm yelling, who's hit? Who's hit? One soldier is struck in the hip, another in the back leg. The squad realizes they are outnumbered. We were like, OK, look, we're not going into this house. We're getting the hell out of here. Velez, at this time, was still posted up at the main gate of where we came in. And he was just rocking away. He just had drum after drum drop before him of empty you know, saw ammo. And we looked at him and basically told him, light up the whole front end of this house. He was like, cool. So he just shot all the windows, all the doors, kept the fire going. 
I knew he was standing over us shooting. I tried to keep my head down and still continue firing. Uh, Howard, he continued to fire. I looked up, saw him reloading, looked back down. Velez empties another 200 round ammo drum. He prepares to reload when the sniper zeroes in on him and fires. Velez collapsed over the back of my legs. He actually passed away laying across my legs. The sniper is finally neutralized. Two Bradley fighting vehicles roll up. The battered squad is medevac to an aid station. We knew that Abe was tore up all over the place. He took three grenades and two 7.62 rounds that actually hit him. I told him I wasn't getting medevac till I had a cigarette. And we're like, oh, OK, he's fine. Of the seven-man squad, four are wounded. Velez will not live to fight another day. It was real hard when we found out that we had lost Velez. He gave his life to save us. And it, he was really loved between everybody. And he was a real good friend. Specialist Jose Velez will posthumously receive the Bronze and Silver Star, as well as two Purple Hearts for his uncommon bravery serving in Iraq. December 23, 2004. After almost seven weeks of combat, Fallujah reopens to the civilian population. The city was actually more dangerous to its population than it was before because of the amount of unexploded ordnance in the city and because there were still pockets of insurgents that were fighting violently. Task Force Bruno of 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, remains in Fallujah. Then Major Todd de Grossier, a hardcore Marine, rolls into the northeast corner of the Al Dubat neighborhood. He suddenly enters a kill zone. We pulled into the alley. Immediately, we're shot at. There's gunfire going, you could hear it going back and forth across the alley. There were Marines on the second floor that I could, I could hear, but I couldn't see exactly where they were. And there was screaming, there was yelling. There was a lot of gunfire. De Grossier cannot locate the team commander to find out what's going on, so he quickly comes up with a plan. The trapped Marines appear to be isolated in a building labeled Target House 2. De Grossier and his small squad decide to enter Target House 1, which is directly behind it. De Grossier is armed with an M4 carbine, a compact version of the M16A2 series. Lightweight and accurate, it is ideal for close quarter combat. We decided to go in the two-story building behind it and get up second floor of that and attack the enemy from their rear. The Marines are about to face one of their fiercest fights in the battle for Fallujah. Ten AM, December twenty third, two thousand four the northeast corner of the Al Dubat neighborhood, Fallujah, Iraq. After six weeks of fighting, civilians slowly return to Fallujah. But evil still lurks in pockets of the war-torn city. Task Force Bruno of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, has been conducting some last-minute detonating of weapons caches. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Five Marines encounter 30 to 40 insurgents on the building labeled Target House 2. 
Major Todd de Grossier assembles a small squad, attempting to catch the enemy from behind. They enter target house one. They ascend halfway up the stairs when enemy combatants appear above them. Pretty heavy exchange of gunfire. Hand grenades coming down. Basically got driven back down the stairs and back outside. Two Marines are wounded. Two more arrive to assist. De Grossier and his squad reload and re-enter target house one. There was some insurgents down there that a couple of Marines took care of. We went right up the stairs. About halfway up, another insurgent was right there, but we stayed and fought that time. There was a lot of ricochets going around. You could hear stuff whizzing by your ears. A sharp object strikes De Grossier's helmet, grazing his head. The Marine in front of me got shot and fell on top of me, and we kind of fell down the stairs. The insurgents then hurl a grenade down the stairs. It lands near the two Marines. I could see it spinning around. De Grossier tries to pull the wounded Marine away from the grenade. I tried to roll him over me to get him on this side of me, but I couldn't use too heavy. And it just, boom, just blew up. And I got a couple of small pieces in my left leg. Most of the frag from that grenade went into him. De Grossier manages to drag out the wounded Marine. He refuses to be treated for his injuries. De Grossier and his squad repeatedly engage the insurgents. They eventually suppress the enemy so the holdup Marines can retrieve their fallen comrades and safely retreat. 12 p.m. At this point now, we're setting up the geometry of fire. The geometry of fire is 3D battle coordination of infantry, air, and armor. Two M1A1 Abrams tanks roll onto the scene. Each uses an M830 high explosive anti-tank multi-purpose tracer service round. The ammo is extremely effective when attacking buildings and bunkers. De Grossier falls behind the second Abrams tank and communicates directly with Commander Captain Robert Bodish, Company C, 2nd Tank Battalion. Yeah, I saw Major De Grossier looking concerned, and uh, he'd obviously been through some serious hell. De Grossier orders him to fire his main gun at Target House 1. Captain Bodish moves his tank to the next house and fires main gun rounds, followed by machine gun blasts. The tank rounds force the insurgents out, but they quickly take cover in buildings on the other side of the block. Around 1 p.m., De Grossier calls in air support loaded with laser-guided 500-pound bombs. The operator illuminates target houses 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7 with a laser designator. The munition follows a spot of laser energy reflected from the targets. Then the bombs are dropped. When the dust settles, some building interiors remain standing and the enemy resumes firing. In order to bring down the remaining houses, de Grossier orders his men to set up satchel charges, a portable device consisting of C4 explosives. Equipped with satchel bags, a stack of Marines approach target house two. Lance Corporal Carlos Ilaraza is the point man. I kind of had a feeling it was going to be bad. Took out my grenade when I was about to pull the pin. I hopped out of the front door and started shooting. A bullet tears through Ilaraza's leg. Ilaraza's grenade also detonates and sends fragments into his side. 
I don't remember if I pulled a pin first or if I pulled a pin after I got shot. De Grossier enters the courtyard under a hail of fire. Ran around the corner and Marine was laying right there. I reached in to grab him and dragged him back. A lieutenant that was with him in that team uh, saw him get shot right in the back. He jumps back up. The round struck his armor-plated flak vest. Ilaraza isn't as lucky. The guys just kept shooting, man. That's when I got hit in my rib cage and, and in my leg, and my hip, all on the sides. It, it was just an unbelievable sight to see that. It was literally, it was like Hollywood. Pulled the Marine back behind the wall. Just see the blood that was trailing behind. The two Abrams tanks are now positioned in an open area just west of Target House 2. I got on my radio and I called my wingman tank, my XO, Lieutenant Smithley. And I said, on my command, fire. The tanks fire five 120 millimeter rounds into the first and second floors of Target House 2. The tank commander got on the radio and said, you destroyed them. I felt immediate satisfaction because we, we eliminated the threat that had injured the Marines. After 10 punishing hours, the entire block is leveled. 30 dead insurgents are found under the rubble. Major Todd de Grossier receives two Purple Hearts and the Silver Star for his extreme heroism in Fallujah. Major de Grossier, yeah, that guy, he was, uh, he was bad. Our whole chain of command, they took care of us. And I'm thankful to all those guys, because, I mean, if it wasn't for them, I'd be, I wouldn't even be here doing this interview. Major de Grossier's act of heroism was normal. That was routine. I saw it every day. And it's the Marine infantrymen that, that image I have of them in the Battle of Fallujah, I'll never forget. During the major operations in Fallujah, 92 Americans are killed in action. Yet despite the tragic losses, the mission is successful. The insurgency in Fallujah is quelled. And in January 2005, Fallujahs vote in their first democratic election. We saw over 30,000 Fallujah residents stand in long lines all day long to vote in this Iraqi election. A higher voter turnout than any other city in western Iraq. That to me tells the, the story that Fallujahs understood why that operation took place. I'm always proud of what me and my guys did over there. Did what we had to do. And those men, they died for what they thought was right. They died for a cause. They didn't die for nothing. I, I would fight any day with, alongside those men.